Hey, it's Mover Scott from the Imagination Movers, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm your host, Jake Dunball. I'm your hero for us. We have today as always, our co-hosts, Chris Bixby and Matt Bingo. How you guys doing? Doing, doing good. good. Doing good. Hi everybody. How you doing, Jakey? I'm doing great as always. Thank you for asking. Matt, what do we have for today? First off, very excited you folks are with us. Uh, glad you're with us. Our guest today is a voice actor, an on-camera actor, and a host. Some of you may know him as the voice of Mayor White on Doug, but most of you may know him as the host of the iconic game show, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, which premiered on PBS way back in 1991, and it's based on the computer games of the same name, among many others. Here he is, Greg Lee. Greg, welcome. Happy to have you here. Thanks, guys. Thrilling. This is going to be fun. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. So we know who you are. To kind of kick this off, would you uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself and what you do in your own words? Sure. I mean, I've, I've been an actor for about 30 years, I guess. I got started on a lot of, uh, well, first there was a CBS kid show uh, called Dr. Fad uh, back in the 80s. I got started on doing audience warm up. And then I started doing a lot of Nickelodeon shows. I worked on Double Dare for a little while. I worked on a bunch of shows you guys wouldn't even remember, but they were all cool and cool people to work with and stuff. And I did started off in audience warm up, and then I worked into announcing, and then I worked into hosting, and then from there I started doing more, um, more acting stuff and some TV stuff, and eventually found Doug and Carmen, which is probably the two longest things I had ever. Um, and so I still kind of do that. I still write for different people now. I write for Highlights Magazine. My wife and I uh, did a podcast for them and on Audible about Goofus and Gallant. We just finished our second season on there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I do um, voiceover for different stuff, different characters and different groups. So, yeah, I just try to stay busy. It's a little tough right now with all the striking going on, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I think that's all that. I think that's I think that's what you asked. I was telling mm-hmm. Jake. I was telling Jake before. Oh, I guess he's coming back. I told Jake before. I hope I know these answers because sometimes I can't remember some of this stuff. It's been so long ago. But oh, right. It's, yeah. It's all right. No worries. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I'll ask this while he's gone. But um, so before becoming an actor, what was your background like, and how did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Nebraska and a little bit in Oklahoma, and um, uh, my dad was a preacher. And uh, so I was a preacher. I was a kid preacher for a while, like when I was like 12 years old, 15 years old. Uh, and then I did that after I went to college for that. And then I, uh, after college, I preached for a few years in Oklahoma. And then that, and then when I stopped doing that, I went to New York City and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So I think I was 25 when I went there. And then, um, you know, I was a waiter and a security guard and a bike messenger with no bike. And uh, I did a bunch of different jobs like that. I taught English for a while. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And so so the, actually the guy who came up with Doug, I knew him from church and he he um, he got me my first job doing the audience warm up on that Dr. Fad show. So that's how I started. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, when I was a kid, I farmed a lot, you know, because I grew up in Nebraska, Oklahoma. So I, you know, I worked on pig farms and wheat farms and drove trucks and tractors and stuff like that yeah. nice yeah. so how were you inspired to get into acting um well you know i guess it was sort of a um, it wasn't really a plan of mine i mean it really was a matter of just i just sort of i needed a job and so uh the first job i got on that dr fad show that jim jenkins gave me was um as a production assistant so i was like painting sets and getting coffee for people and stuff and after like two weeks he came and said look you're going to get fired you're no good at this job (laughs) then then that's when he had me do audience warm-up and then i was pretty good at audience warm-up for a while so uh, i think i would i just took i worked at that job for a long time for a lot of different shows a lot of different nickelodeon shows you know and then i just sort of fell into different things when they needed an announcer for something then i did that then when they needed 
host. I did that. So I just kind of, it wasn't something I was mm, planning to do at all. It just sort of happened. And then I just kind of did it, you know, and I, I guess I still kind of do that now. Not, uh, not so much acting stuff anymore, but more writing stuff and voiceover stuff. You know? So I didn't really have much of a dying desire to do it necessarily, you know, like a lot of my friends, which is great, but I just never really had it. I was happy doing what I was doing, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So one of your earliest acting gigs was on a Sesame Street home video. Sesame that... Street visits Sesame Street visits the firehouse. Yeah, man. That was this fun. was a little bit a little bit before Carmen. What what was it like working on that uh visiting the firehouse? Well, it was really great, man. I mean, oh, that's a big B. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> wow. I'm sitting here scratching all the mosquito bites I've got since I got up here. We're up here on the St. Lawrence River, and I just, I love it so much, but man, bugs don't like me much. Um, uh... it, was, it was really great. It was, um, uh, I got that from a, a guy named Andy Bamberger hooked me up with that. He was a great director and producer at Nickelodeon, and uh, he got me that that job. And it was maybe three days or four days. I can't remember. I was in New York City at the time. I think it shot in over New Jersey. And, you know, it was really thrilling for me because I got to work with Big Bird and a bunch of the characters. And, you know, it was a blast. I mean, the, they were so good. I still think even after all the uh, television kids TV that I've done over the years, I still think that, you know, Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street were still kind of the standard bearers of Here's how you really do quality kids TV. And I, oh yeah, Sesame Street Absolutely. still is that in my book. So it was just amazing to, as a young actor, to be able to just watch them, you know, really do their thing and do it so so well, and flawlessly. And you know, everyone was happy, and you know, it was clearly worked. They were long days and stuff. But I remember the one scene that always I always crack up about, you know, because Carol Spinney was Big Bird at that time before he passed mm -hmm. away. And he was the original guy, and, you know, he, he, he's got to hold the head up here, you know, with his arm and he's watching a monitor and he was just a, a great, great guy. But he and I had to ride on the back of a uh, fire truck at one point. And, you know, so we we're just kind of bouncing like this and he's up here like this, you know, trying to hold on with those gloved feathered hands, you know. So it was just always a crack up to me to, that we both survived that particular ride because it was pretty bumpy for a while. But it was great. I mean, that's all. I don't I have good memories of that show just because it was it, it didn't last very long, but it was um, it was just a great, cool bunch of people. Yeah. So now um, your work as a host began on Nickelodeon game shows, Total Panic and Ally Here. Can you talk a bit about those? Yeah. Total Panic was the was the big show that I got my first big break on. It was a three hour live television show on Sunday mornings. So it was three hours live. Man, and they stuck everything in there too. They had like games and interviews and mm, uh, uh, cartoons and just all kinds of stuff. Just constantly because you had so much time to fill and it was live. And I'd just been the warm up guy for that show and then the announcer. And so when they lost one of their hosts and they had me come on, it was, I have to say, those producers were really trusting and really patient with me because I had no idea what I was doing. And it was completely live, you know. And uh, uh, they were just really good to me. I learned so much on that show so fast. I think we did it for, I don't know, two years or three years. And I, it was just the best way for me to learn a lot of stuff really, really fast about television production and how to do it on that side of the camera. Because I, like I say, I was perfectly happy as an announcer and and as a warm-up guy, I had a blast doing that job. And uh, hosting was a little bit different. But uh, the, all the producers on that show were really, really, really great, uh, talented people and very, very patient with me. And my co-host, Molly Scott, was just the greatest and encouraging and helping me. And so I, I think I've been fortunate to run into some really sweet people over the years who have uh, really helped to mentor me and stuff because uh, it certainly didn't have to be that way, you know, but I kind of just had really, really good people. And a lot of those people I still work with today, you know, from those days. Oh, it's nice. Right. That's awesome. Yep, yep. Definitely. I have so, such sweet stories. <laughs> 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 I can't help it. I, I mean, I just have, I've had some nice people, you know. I don't know. Right. <laughs> All right. So, Absolutely. now your longest running hosting gig, which we mentioned in your introduction, was on Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? 
How, right. how did how did you uh, begin working on that? Uh, Carmen was just a regular, you know, gig that you went. My age agent told me to manager told me to go to an audition you know so i went to the audition some of the guys that had been on that show i had done some other warm-up stuff with for other shows so i did know some of them but i think they said they had like 300 people they were looking at for the host and then they got down to the last three of us and i remember for the that last because you kind of audition and re-audition you know as you whittle people down so it takes kind of a long process and so I remember when we got down to the final audition, it was me and two other guys and uh, all the producers that were there from um, Pittsburgh and uh, Boston were there. And I just remember <laughs> knowing I wasn't going to get that job because <laughs> these other guys were really good and they were really experienced and it traveled a lot. And I just, I just hadn't done that much stuff really. So um my audition didn't go that well that day but i but somehow got it and then um i think probably having worked warm up with some of those producers on other shows they knew that i was okay with not knowing what was going to happen you know because there was still a lot to work out for karma at that point but um so yeah it was just a normal audition and i somehow got it and uh uh it was phenomenal i have great friends from there i met my wife on that show and um Oh. it was just a really again tremendous amount of people and that first year was kind of tough you know because we were still kind of working it out so we kind of changed rules as we right. went that first year and if you ever watch the old reruns on um not the old i guess the old tapes on uh, like youtube you can always tell the first season of the show uh, first season show because i have different colored coats on because mm -hmm. after the first season then that's when i just have the blue coat it's always the blue coat years two to five but the first season i had like a red coat and a green coat and other things and and mm -hmm. i forget why they did that it was some reason to do with the uh I, like what what you could i think you could put images on the blue coat or something i can't remember but I, I guess it was also easier for us to shoot segments out of uh out of order if i had the same uniform on as opposed to changing it all so i think that was the main reason mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah Awesome. Karma was also the first place they the first people that gave me a chance to write stuff because I did a lot of the oh uh, when I go into Lynn's office I did a bunch of those sketches and then I did I, I, they eventually let me do a lot of character stuff that I wrote myself so they they also gave me uh, just a chance to try that which you know you, you really can't learn that stuff unless you just do it and somebody gives you a chance to try it kind of guide you along right yeah right so. yeah first place i got to do that and and i have to say even now more than anything else i like writing more than almost anything else i just really get a kick out of writing you know just <laughs> for stuff awesome. yeah. so, mm -hmm. so now um do you have any like favorite rounds or challenges from the show oh um well i mean obviously the the, the most exciting was always that last round i you you guys Ooh. are way too young to have seen that show, right? When we were on, you're all you're all no, like, no when it was on, but I've seen a bunch of them on, on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, the last, I mean, the last big round with the big map was always the most. You know, that was what everybody was hanging around for. You know, so it was always oh, yeah. really exciting. And I always felt like I was more of a kid's teammate than anything. You know, so I, if I could just read it faster and really go and encourage them, you know, to get it to go there. Um, the middle round was always fun because Rockapella are phenomenally talented singers uh, would try to make me laugh during that round with their little stings that they would do. Um, and of course, working with Lynn always was, was the best because she was such a, she was a true professional Tony winner. And I think she won Emmys and stuff like that. She was the real, a real actor, you know? So she again was very patient with me and very helpful and was a mentor to me. So working with her on, on those sketches, uh, for me was a real uh thrill and and i learned a lot again on that doing that too because um especially i think after the first or second years when we started shooting all of lynn's things first we would bring her in and we would do all the chief stuff by itself and uh so she and i would spend a couple of weeks just the two of us working on those things so it was always fun to do that too definitely so, yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting so mm -hmm. you you just mentioned Rockapella, uh, which Frozen was mentioned was the house band uh, on yeah. 
house band. Carmen. Right? What was it like working with Rockapella? Well, I mean, if you ever get a chance to meet any one of those guys, you'll find that they are supremely talented, supremely sweet, hilariously funny, and, you know, they, they just um, – Kind of what you see is what you get with those guys. I mean, if, if they you, you get the feeling that you would really like those guys, you you would. <laughs> it's the, they're all just that way. They're just very great guys, you know. And so, you know, anytime you shoot any television show, I don't care what it is, but particularly like a game show or any any TV show, I guess it takes a long time to do those. I mean, it, it, it you have very long days. That sometimes you're not doing very much, but you're setting stuff up and getting things ready and making sure the audience is okay. And so you have a lot of time when you're not you're not studying, you're not rehearsing, you're not getting ready, and you're just kind of waiting for things to go. And so you end up spending a lot of time with people kind of hanging around, which can be a really horrible part of the job. It's going to be just mank. <laughs> you're just waiting like you're in a doctor's office. It's going to be really hard. Definitely. So if you have people, if you have people like them, that, you know that you're just, that are just fun and funny, it makes that time swing by a lot, a lot faster. Absolutely. So in in oh, yeah. recent in recent years, we've been able. There have been sort of this uh, resurgence of, I guess, nostalgia for that show and for a lot of shows in the '90s. So we've been asked to do some, you know, comic cons and stuff. And so uh, we haven't all met together yet. We've done some Zoom stuff. Um, but just being able to be reconnected like that, you know, has kind of been one of those things. I mean, you guys probably feel it too. You can go, you know, several weeks without talking to each other and then you get together and it's kind of like you were always there. So it's funny to yeah. me, after all these years, it's still kind of the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, everybody's yeah. normal and real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And on the subject of uh, Rockapella, actually, Sean Altman's one of our uh, previous guests. He's a good friend of mine. Oh. Oh, Sean! Yeah, yeah. he's awesome. Amazing, yes, man. great, very, 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 very funny guy. guy. Very funny guy. He's very hilarious. funny guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely. And he yeah. wrote he one of the most iconic songs of all time. I mean, oh he, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And uh, similarly with uh, Lynn Thigpen, which I know it's been a little over 20 years since we lost her. Can you share any of your fondest memories from you know knowing Lynn and working with her? Oh. That's always a hard question for me. I appreciate you asking it, but it's always hard just because I, you know, Lynn was really a good good friend of mine, and I really loved her, and I still do. And, you know, she was just, uh, you know, I was kind of a squirrely guy from Nebraska who hadn't done anything but, you know, bang around New York City and do some stuff. And she, she was always just very generous with me and was a great mentor to me. And, you know, we just laughed hard. I don't know. She's just, I have nothing bad to say about it. Lynn, I couldn't because she's just always was too good. She kind of, I think of anything about her, she taught me that, you know, you don't have to worry about what people say about your performance so much. You just do what you do and it kind of lands where it lands. I just that I always thought that was a big uh, lesson I learned from her. I don't know if she meant to teach that or not, but I certainly got that from her. So, yeah, I, we miss her a lot, man. She was, she was the whole, I always said that show uh, I was never the star of that show. It was always Lynn, Rockapella, Carmen, the map, the kids, and then maybe me down there someplace. But she, she was clearly the star of that show in my book. Yeah, and I, I grew up uh, with Lynn watching uh, Bear in the Big Blue House because she voiced Luna oh, right. on that show. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's funny what all you see her in and hear her voice and stuff. Yeah. Definitely. After Carmen ended you hosted a short-lived game show called nitro yeah nitro yes. yeah. <laughs> very short-lived and well, i mean like, i don't even short. you know i did we i did we shoot six of those i can't remember that was an interesting experience because uh, i can't even remember who we did that for to be honest with you again some very sweet people they were out in colorado and we kind of it was kind of a quick turnaround thing to do uh a few shows and i don't not sure if anyone knew what the show was when we got there i'm not sure if there was really a, a solid script yet there was sort of an idea for a show um i knew so little about what was going on with that we, i know we had a lot of games that would come around uh, the night before we try to get them together but it's a very 
very low budget um, uh, experience that uh, didn't take too long to do. And I can't, I honestly cannot remember who we did it for. Um, but I think it was supposed to be sort of an in-house sort of regional thing. Um, that I've since seen snippets of on online before. But I remember, again, it was nice people. It was a hard shoot because it was it was a lot of work in a very short period of time. And we didn't have a very big staff at all. We had one writer and one host and one producer. And it was, uh, yeah, it was quick. <laughs> so... Kind of moving on from your hosting work, one of your other most known roles, as you mentioned, was voicing uh, Mayor White in both the Nickelodeon and Disney versions of Doug. What was oh, it like yeah. working on that show for many years? It was great. It was, um, you know, the, he started off as the principal that, or started off as the mayor and then, and then went to ABC. I think they moved him over to the principal. Um, that character was just, my, I, I kind of, it was a character I did as a kid. My, my father's a, uh, I, I knew a lot of guys that talked like like Mayor White. I knew a lot of guys growing up talk, that who talked like him. So I used to do that for Jim Jenkins, the guy who, um, and and David Campbell, the guys who who did Doug. And um, when they started coming up with the idea of Doug, they wanted to use that that character in some way. So I, we kind of built it around that silliness that I used to do. So it was always a very of all the stuff I've done, that was always a very natural, easy character to do because I'd done it for a long time. Even on Carmen, we Phil the Barber was kind of based on that same voice, the guy that comes out and cuts hair, who cut Sean's big braid at the end of the the last show. Um, so I'm um, but you know, voiceover is great because you don't have hair, you don't have makeup, you don't have costuming, you just kind of walk in and read and then leave. And that was always a fun thing to do. So yeah, it was good. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. I grew awesome. up with Doug. I have the DVD in the background. No, oh yeah. Do I see him there? Wait a minute. Is it in that stack? That oh, right there. Oh, right there on your bed. Oh yeah. Is that the movie? Huh? Is that the movie or is it? No, the it's TV? it's it's all the episodes of the Nickelodeon version. Holy cow! Wow. So, wow. do you have any like fa like favorite Doug episodes? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you, my favorite ones were always on the Nick, the, the earlier ones uh, on Nickelodeon were my more favorite ones for a variety of reasons. One, I liked just the way the the um, the animation looked because that I think they did it in France then. Um, it just looked, it just had for me had an interesting texture to it. So I've always been more of a fan of some of the earlier shows. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think of a particular one that that I remember. Uh, I mean, other than the first one, the first one was just, it was very, very exciting to see it all come together. I'd watched Jimmy um, draw that character for a number of years when he was over at Children's Television Workshop, just kind of doodling around, drawing Doug, you know. We didn't know it was Doug at the time. And then he first did a did a, a book uh, about Doug that I think, I think that's what he used to pitch, to pitch it to Nickelodeon when they were doing the animation. But so probably the first one, just because it was, kind of the coolest thing that all that was kind of happening you know mm -hmm. yeah that's probably. a good one my favorite episode of doug i think is the christmas one yes oh, christmas. i love the christmas one <laughs> that's a classic that yeah that's a goodie that's a goodie yeah that's yeah because yeah. sometimes back on uh when they would have all the old nick shows on on demand i remember that was always the episode they had of doug like they had a that i think like five episodes of each of the classic shows and i remember the every yeah, year the christmas one would be on there so that, that was yeah, yeah. fun that's a fun episode yeah yeah yep <laughs> yep uh, yeah I was, I was gonna say the same the christmas one's a really really good one yeah we're, we're all really good ones um but you would you would mention the movie a moment ago what was it like working on uh on the movie uh doug's first movie well, I mean, I, of course, what I was doing, I mean, it was the same as any other episode, you know, it w there wasn't anything uh, different for me. I think for the guys, it was a lot different because, uh, you know, they had big billboards in Los Angeles and I think New York about the movie and there was a bigger budget for it. And there was just a lot more stuff that was happening with it, you know, but I didn't have anything to do with that. I was just for, for me, all of it was the same as if, excuse me, as if it was a regular uh, episode. So I, but it was exciting that they were getting to do a movie, you know, so in that oh, sense, yeah. it's a different thing. Yeah. 
So you also voice the character of Chad Dimple and another Jim Jenkins broadcast yep. poop dogs. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, Chad Dimple's a little bit like the mayor who's a little bit like Phil the Barber. <laughs> same kind of character again. I think for, I think for Chad Nipple, he was the closest thing to the original character that I did, which which I've called Brother Preacher. Brother Preacher, I've done for many many years, like as a stage act. And uh, Chad Nipple is this uh, is this kind of um, kind of a bumbling preacher guy, you know, who means well but kind of makes some mistakes once in a while. So um, I think that was probably the most again the most obvious the the easiest one to do probably for me because it was the closest to the original character that i did for a while for a long long time so but it made jimmy laugh it made david laugh so that was usually good <laughs> before doug i was doing some uh work for jim uh children's television workshop i think i was just like running around getting props for stuff and things and this is long before cell phones and all that stuff you know right if I went out and did something, you always had to get find a cell, find a, a pay phone in New York, get your quarters out, blah blah blah, and call back to the office. And what do I got to go? What do I need to do now? That kind of stuff. Huh. Anyway, Jimmy was the guy because <laughs> he had set. We he had a we had a couple of meetings I was supposed to go to, and I was such a dummy back then. I I would I was missing the meetings because I for, I would forget about them, and yes. Jimmy was the guy. I Jim, I should say, but I always call him Jimmy. But Jimmy was the guy uh, who he called me into his office finally, and he sat me down like a very big brotherly speech. You can, I, you can, you should talk to him about this. I think he remembers this because because uh, I brought it up to him recently, and he said, "Look, dude, you're not going to have much of a career <laughs> if you don't show up for meetings, and you got to remember your stupid meetings." And so he gave me this thing. They used to have a thing called day planners, like a little calendar book that you would put in your calls and all your stuff and he gave me a brand new one he showed me how to use it and ever since then i never was late for meetings i never missed forgot anything you know and it was because he sat down took the time but very kindly just right told me here's right. how you gotta do it you're 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 okay guy but you're gonna mess up you're messing meetings with me you're gonna miss them with other people you gotta get your meeting thing together so here's your day planner here's how it works try that so he did a lot of good things for me he bought me a suit once it was very nice oh wow yeah, mm. i didn't have money for a suit he got me a suit yeah yeah good man oh of course. Yeah, definitely so moving on to some more of your uh on camera acting you appeared in an episode of the uh long-running george lopez sitcom what, what, yeah, was, that? Yeah. what was that like <laughs> it was it was fun it was again good people it was a quick it was a quick day i didn't have much to do on that one uh so i just kind of came in did my lines and left you know sometimes that's uh if you're a working actor that's a, a lot of what your stuff could be i think one of the reasons they're the strike is on now is because these days with streaming you know it's hard to get the residuals you're looking for and so um, right yeah used to be you could make good money doing those you know and you could like i still get residuals from 30 years ago but now you don't get them so much anymore from a lot of stuff it just it's just not there anymore so it's a it's a hard to make that a viable career anymore right and if you do it's like not very much not at all like sometimes it's just a dollar two dollars or not very much it's not very much and so it, you know when i first started if you did a national commercial like i did um for three years i did these commercials for a, a snack food called flips they're like chocolate covered pretzels you know mm. You got a national hmm. commercial that lasted a while. You could, you know, you could buy a house. You could have a, you know, there you make good money, right? Well, now you kind of get paid for the day and not very much afterwards, and it's it's, it's a it's a tough way to make dough anymore. But you know, I kind of understand the other side too because with streaming and some of that stuff, it's hard for them to make their advertising money. So it's a little bit, uh, it's an interesting time, you know, for all that stuff. So, right. Yeah. So so Lopez. Again, great people, fun time, um, uh, but not very long. I mean, it's just a day that I did on there. So, right. Yes. Uh, so you also starred in several films. One of them, including the drama film "Eye of the Dolphin," playing yeah, the role yeah. of Principal McCowid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for those that don't know, could you kind of describe that movie to the best of your ability? And what was it? What it was like working on it? That? Was it was a good friend of mine, um, um, 
Susan Johnson produced that movie, and she's gone on to, to direct a lot of great things. She did uh, Carrie Pilby. She did To All the Boys I've Loved Before, some huge, huge flicks. And she's a very talented director and producer. Um, and so she brought me on for that. And, um, you know, the movie is just kind of one of those cool, um, I don't know how to describe it really. But anytime you got kids and teenagers and dolphins and ocean stuff, you know, it can be some good stuff. So, um, yeah, that was an early movie for her, I think, fairly early. Um, but, uh, but again, it was, a, it was, uh, it was good to do, you know, just another one of those jobs, but it was fun to work with Susan on that too. Yep. Definitely. You yeah. also, uh, starred in the movie, The Between, which was based on the, the novel of the same name. Can you talk a little bit about that? It, it was the same bunch again, for the most part, in a lot of ways, the Susan Johnson there again, and hmm. the same bunch and, um. Uh, I can't remember what I did on in between. Was I a voice guy on that? I can't remember. I can't remember offhand. But um, yeah, same same kind of thing. You know, when you when you have my kind of career, that's kind of what your jobs are a lot of times. Until you get you know the long term stuff. For the shorter stuff, it's sort of a day, a couple of days here and there, and you're you're kind of uh you know you. It's not a glitzy, glamorous thing. It's more just a, a job that you go do, you know. It's and uh, so that's what a lot of those are. So, so they're as fun as they they're as fun as any job is. They're as boring as any job is. They're as hard as any job is. You know, they're just always kind of similar. Again, I've just been lucky to be able to have a lot of people that are great to work with and professional, and you know that that can make it a lot easier. So I've been lucky that way. Mm -hmm. So aside from acting for TV and film, you also act in various commercials. Can you talk about, about some of your commercial acting? Uh, well, yeah, that one was the uh, flips. That was probably the longest one that I've had with the with the with the pretzels. I see one, some of them on once in a while on YouTube. Um, boy, I did a lot of commercials. I can't really remember all of those. Um, and the ones that last the longest are snack foods. You kind of go through a period in your career age-wise, and I think it's probably still this way. When I started, you used to have a lot more dialogue, a lot more scene work that would happen with commercials. It sort of started moving into, uh, they got much, much shorter. It wasn't so much dialogue. It was more reacting. I think a lot of it's more reacting now than a lot of stuff. Um, but at the time, when I started, it was, it was more... Um, scene work and you're kind of age-wise you're in the, a group called um they used to call it the young marrieds so like if you were in your late 20s early 30s that uh advertising group was sort of um uh you get a lot of calls because there's a lot of things that they that they're pushing you know whether it's disneyland or cars or credit cards or whatever, whatever you, all the things that happened during that time of life there were a lot of, of those commercials once you hit like Mm, late 30s early 40s th those kind of go away because they, they kind of age out of them and then it comes back when you're kind of my age when um, they start talking about retirement stuff yeah right <laughs> yeah so, yeah. so i was pretty busy for a long time just because i was in that age group more than anything there was just a lot more stuff to do you know definitely so since we're kind of getting close to uh wrapping this up so to uh, to anyone watching or listening, what would you like to say to those who have supported you throughout your career? Oh, I mean, just a big, huge, cheerful, uh, eye welling up, you know, uh, thank you and graciousness to so many people that were so good to me for so long and still are. And um, it, it's made all the difference in the world and to have great people to work with. It's just, you know, I have no complaints about any of it. I mean, Plenty of people have had better careers than mine, longer, more longer lasting, more exciting. But I don't know that anyone's had more fun than I have had or have had, you know, as good of people to work with as I've had. So I consider myself very, very, very lucky. And I'm lucky to be on this show with you guys, too. I think you guys do a great job, man. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. It means, it means a lot. It means a good lot. success. So if people would like to connect with you, where can people find you? Well, I mean, I, I see people find me on Facebook. I'm not a great Facebook person, but I try to respond when I get on there. I just don't get on there very much. Um, uh, that's probably the, the, the best way. I I'm, I have a presence on LinkedIn, but I don't look at 
don't like that very much either. Uh, if they talk to you and you want to give them my email, I don't mind. They can have that. They can talk to me that way. Nice. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Yes, and the the very last uh, question that Jake's about yeah. to ask is the question we ask all of our guests at the end. Go ahead, Jake. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, of course, you know, this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia. Yeah, yep. look at that. Yep. When you think of nostalgia, what do you think of, or in your own words, how would you define the word nostalgia? Oh, nostalgia. I've never been, of all the years, I've never been asked that question. That's a pretty good question, Jake. Uh, thank you. I guess my first my first thought about that is nostalgia is a kind of a warm fuzzy sock, you know that usually makes me feel pretty good. Usually, you know, because right. it's a, it's always some good old memory. Usually from when I was a kid, probably you know, yeah. Right. You know, you're, I'm you're... not much for, I'm not much for reunions or you know going to high school reunions or college reunions much. Cause I don't, I don't, I don't really, I'm, nothing wrong with looking back. I, I don't mind looking back, but I just don't do it very much. Um, but, but there are some things, you know, some mm-hmm. Saturday mornings you'll get nostalgic for some old cartoons or something. And it's, it's a big deal. Definitely you know? great word to send on. So, well, nice. Greg, nice. thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This was a blast. Yes. So thank you very much, yes. Greg, you know, for, for being on the show and thank you so I'm much you know, for you be a part, you know, for what you've done for, you know, and be wow. a part of our lives and keep up the great work and can i wait what's next what's next in store for you Thanks, yes man. and our our, our, yes, our buddy d our, our buddy dj bob says hi as well oh good i like old dj oh, bob. he's he's oh, so amazing he's a cool dude good guy yes. oh yes great job guys you're really thank great you. i wish you all the success thank you as well thank you, you so much okay bye-bye thanks a lot all right, enjoy the rest of your Cheers, day Greg. yeah see ya and say cool. bye from us as well yeah, yes, we absolutely enjoyed our time with Greg Lee. Um, keep on the lookout for more wonderful interviews. And as always, what do we say, Jake? Keep nostalgia alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time for for more new episodes. Great coming your way. Can I yes. wait? Keep your eye out for that. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.